everyone again to, uh, to NAPA. I'm Chris Fries. If you don't know me, I'm the uh, surgical director of the adult kidney program and also the interim chief of, of, trans, of a, the abdominal transplant program at UCSF. And uh, what I'd like to do now is um, kind of tell you what this fantastic team that we have at UCSF is, is able to accomplish. First of all, thank you for your referrals. It's a lot of them. Um, the annualized this year is be close to 2,500, a bit more than we had in 2018. And from these referrals, we'll get down to about 1,200 new patient evaluations, again, similar to what we saw in 2018. We, of course, are always trying to um, promote living donation, and we have a very robust input of living donor health history questionnaires, 2,500 a year that need to be sorted out by our team and hopefully result in, in some living donor transplants. And then of course, as we do a lot of transplants, it means a lot of post-op cares. And uh, this year we're annualized to have about 5,800 um, transplant visits in our post-clinic. So you can see all those names that uh, Dr. Aidy presented to you really are needed um, to keep up with this large volume of work. In terms of the number of transplants uh, we're doing, uh, again, fiscal year 2019 looks to be another great year. I just saw some newer numbers that are indicating that we'll probably have about 370 annualized uh, uh, kidney transplants for 2019 fiscal year. Um, living donor is about 125. Um, we are the leading program in the country for paired kidney exchange through the National Kidney Registry with 51 transplants uh, in the last year. Uh, that's up slightly from 2018. So over a third of our living donor transplants that we're doing are because of the paired exchange program. We're still transplanting a large number of high, highly sensitized patients, meaning a CPRA of 98 to 100%. And in this year, we're annualized to do about 53 of those transplants. So again, these are patients that in the past, we might have done a couple handfuls, but with the newer allocation uh, system, we're doing a lot more highly sensitized patients. One area where we've definitely seen some growth is the use of hepatitis C uh, positive donor kidneys. We've essentially doubled our use of those kidneys in this fiscal year, and that's been after an, a more intensive program to get patients who already have hepatitis C and are eligible to receive these kidneys ready on the wait list. So it's definitely resulted in an increase in these types of transplants. The uh, high KDPI kidneys, again, kidneys which are sometimes called expanded donor kidneys or marginal donor kidneys, we're doing about uh, 17 a year annualized for, for this year. Again, we'd like to see that area grow a bit more. And then as um, has been alluded to, the high risk uh, kidneys, um, uh, we are still very aggressive in using those kidneys with patient's consent. And it looks like we're on target to do about 65 of those types of transplants. So again, areas where we're trying to uh, use kidneys um, that might not be used at other centers to get more patients transplanted. Well, unfortunately, our wait list still remains huge. Um, we've been able to keep it under um, uh, 5,000. We're now at, uh, at about 4,800. And um, in the last uh, reporting period, which was from July 2017 to June 2019, we had uh, another 900 patients added to the list. Uh, we, we removed about 930 patients, and about 350 of those were because of transplant, but unfortunately about 270 of those removals were due to patient deaths. So obviously that's the number that we'd like to not see um, uh, at all, if possible. So and in terms of outcomes with these large number of transplants, we would like to maintain excellent outcomes, and I think we've been able to do that. If you look at our um, uh, one-year survival for all of our transplants over a two-and-a-half-year period, which represents 760 transplants, we had a one-year survival of 97.3. For um, living donors, we do a bit better with a one-year survival of 99.6. 
and using the new uh, bar rating system, five bars means better than expected. So we're very proud of that result. And then our deceased donor transplants as well are doing, doing quite, quite well. Now another way to look at this data is in this uh, chart, which basically shows um, what you would expect to be a sort of average program. If you're below the line, you're doing better than expected. Above the line, you're doing worse. And this represents our center. And along the x-axis is volume of transplants. So you can see we're a high volume center and we're falling into the area of better than, survived, uh, better than predicted survival. And this represents one year outcomes. And a similar pattern we see for three year outcomes as well, better than expected uh, in a large volume center. So in summary, we remain one of the busiest transplant centers in the country and thank you for supporting our program. Uh, despite the long wait times that we experience in the Bay Area as our outcomes are still remaining better than expected in general. And again, we're a very busy center for uh, exchange kidney transplants. So we really appreciate your support of our program and, and again, we're thrilled to take care of your patients and continue to provide uh, excellent results. So last year I started um, a little segment of a historical vignette. Um, I heard that it was fairly well received, so I'm going to do it once again this year as my closing uh, part of my talk. And this year I'd like to um, uh, talk about Oscar Salvatierra, who I'm sure many in the room know and have worked with um, and is certainly one of the pioneers in transplantation and in our program at UCSF. So Dr. Salvatierra was born in Phoenix in 1935. He was an excellent student in grade school and earned himself a pathway to Georgetown for college with a scholarship, first in his family to attend college. He graduated cum laude in 1957 and then went on to receive his MD degree at the University of Southern California in 1961. He actually did his pediatric urology residency at LA Children's and also did a, an adult urology residency at uh, University of Southern California and LA County Medical Center. And in his early career, he developed a keen interest in renal disease and renal failure. And of course, back in those days, dialysis access and dialysis in general was sort of a new world. And not a lot of people were interested in, in placing the Scribner shunts in the early forms of dialysis access, but he took a keen liking to it and actually got very interested in following patients with renal failure. And that was forced, uh, reinforced even further when he spent time uh, in the military in Vietnam and actually took care of a fair number of patients with renal failure, both soldiers and civilians who um, uh, were injured. In 1972, he returned uh, to medical practice after serving in Vietnam with a keen interest to pursue uh, the care of patients with renal failure and thought it would be best to pursue this new field of transplantation and actually I guess was our first fellow under Dr. Belzer and Dr. Kuntz at UCSF. He very quickly rose to become the chief of transplant in 1974. He of course has a long list of scientific accomplishments and one of the fun things about doing these sort of historical reviews of people is to go back and look at some of their early publications and it's really quite fascinating to see what he was, was publishing on. He had over 300 publications. The major contributions that he's recognized for are the use of donor-specific transfusions in an effort to um, uh, allow for better outcomes in kidney transplantation. He, of course, was an outstanding pediatric transplant surgeon and willing to take on very difficult cases with complex urologic anomalies. He's well known for that. He also is well known for really describing how to make an adult kidney in a tiny patient, a child, work. What the fluid requirements are, how do you deal with this kidney that's used to a certain blood pressure and a certain volume status, sur survive in a baby. And it was really his work that uh, propelled results in uh, pediatric transplantation to, to much higher levels than they had been at the time. And then most recently, he's well known for his steroid-free immunosuppression protocols in pediatric kidney transplant. 
Now, when I looked over um, his list of papers, one that struck me as quite interesting was his report in the Annals of Surgery in 1977 of the first 1,000 kidney transplants done at UCSF. And you can see the list of surgeons on the paper, as well as Kent Cockrum, who uh, ran the um, immunogenetics lab. And this was one of the biggest series uh, in the country. So UCSF, even back in the early days, was a leader in transplantation. And it's quite fascinating to look at, at what, what was reported in this paper. Uh, the dark uh, lines are cadaver transplants from 1964 through 1976. And you can see the white bars, which are living donor, were all that was available in the very first days of the program, but uh, became less and less as uh, the team at UCSF figured out organ perfusion and how to better use deceased donor transplants. Of course, results were best back in those days with living donor transplants because of the opportunity to have a well-matched graft. And really, these results at, at five years for an HLA identical transplant are very similar to what you would see today. And of course, that's because immunosuppression was not as important in an HLA matched graft setting. But you can see when you had mismatched grafts, even in a living donor setting, getting five-year results of 38% is something that would be uh, considered good back then. And you saw our results at one year of 99% survival with living donor transplants. So the uh, results were quite different back then. And even more uh, um, disparate were the deceased donor transplant results compared to today. You can see results where you'd be, be considered doing well if you could achieve 40% five-year survival. Imagine that. And one thing I think the authors of this paper felt especially proud of was the fact that patients returned to their pre-dialysis status at five years if they had a successful transplant 91% of the time. And of course, that's what a big part of transplant is really all about, is restoring the health of patients. So they could do that back in 1977 as well. So as Dr. Salvatierra moved on in his career, he, of course, became well-recognized both nationally and internationally and was elected the 10th president of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. And in his presidential address, which I was able to review, he actually outlined six areas where he thought improvement needed to be made, both in the way we uh, deal with organ distribution and patient care and at a regulatory level. And these six items include solving the issue of organ shortage, a problem which still continues today, probably even more so, a need for a nationwide network for organ distribution and sharing, a need for scientific registry of all transplants so we could learn what we're doing well and not doing well, to modify the reimbursement system, which at that time was really a disincentive for transplant, and part of this related to the new drug cyclosporin and figuring out how that would be paid for, and then to address the sale of organs to make sure it doesn't happen. And lastly, uh, a, a means to further address the problems in transplant and study it with, with funding from the federal government. And these initiatives, which he felt were very important, came to fruition in a bill that was passed at the federal government known as NODA in 1984. And this is a bill that he pushed through with the help of uh, Al Gore. Um, he had near unanimous passage in the House and Senate, but it was not without a lot of effort and in calling on a lot of senators and, and congressmen to approve this bill. But this allowed the establishment of the Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, now what we know as UNOS, who became the contractor for this, um, this area. And it also contained very specific language to guide the policy for organ allocation, make selling of organs illegal, and put in place methods to monitor outcomes. And these are still uh, policies that we live by today. He uh, also was the UNOS president from 1985 to 1986. And in an interview, he stated that this was really one of his um, most um, proud achievements. And here you can see him uh, later in years with a, a letter from Al Gore um, documenting the passage of this bill. And then here's uh, Mr. Gore visiting him uh, when he was in the Bay Area for a talk. So uh, probably one of the, the biggest achievements uh, that Dr. Salvatierra reached, at least at a, a national level. 
Later in his career, he left UCSF. He was there again from 1972 to 1991. Uh, spent some time at California Pacific Medical Center and then moved on to establish the Pediatric Renal Transplant Program at Packard Children's Hospital in 1994. Um, he uh, became very interested in, and uh, enthusiastic about teaching in uh, 2006 through 2015 while he was the Associate Dean for Medical Students and was a very well-loved uh, professor and mentor and uh, then became Professor Emeritus of Surgery and Pediatrics at Stanford. In the year 2000, he was uh, the TTS, the International Transplant Society President, and was actually um, in uh, Rome to meet uh, Pope John Paul II. I was actually at that meeting as well. This was quite a, an amazing event to have the Pope come to speak to our transplant community uh, at that particular meeting. And here's uh, Dr. Salvatierra shaking his hand. Uh, he had a whole list of other honors, including knighthood uh, by the Republic of Italy, presidential medal from the president of Argentina. He had a UCSF Chancellor's Award for public service and uh, several awards from Stanford, including the Rombar Mark Award for Excellence in Patient Care and the Franklin Ebau Award for Outstanding Medical Student Advising. And then most recently, uh, through the International Pediatric, Pediatric Transplant Association, he was recognized with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And the Surgical Society, the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, awarded him with our highest honor of our association in 2016 with the uh, Pioneer Award. And here he is shown with, um, with uh, Dr. Charlie Miller receiving that award. So as I'm sure most of you know, he passed away in um, March of uh, 2019, a very sad moment for I think the field of transplantation, certainly for the UCSF community, for the patients that he took care of over all these years. This is one of his quotes, that life is about people. And I think in um, uh, reviewing uh, comments that people have made about Dr. Salvatierra, he definitely loved people, but he loved his colleagues too. Um, I think he had a, a very keen interest in making transplant uh, a, a process that was fair to everybody and always willing to take on challenges. I unfortunately didn't have a lot of interaction with him. He seemed to, or I seemed to come along to places where he had left by the time I got there. But again, he's uh, somewhat legendary at UCSF and I certainly know that our program stands on the shoulders of giants and Dr. Salvi Tierra is probably the uh, greatest example of, of one of these giants. So. So that's my historical vignette, and thank you very much.